Um, so, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, presentation uh, by uh, Professor Sotira Craig. Uh, I think we met at the Institute of Education when you were still working on the Governing by Numbers project, uh, which has been quite influential to understand how uh, international organizations, so it's the, as the OECD, are kind of setting the governance uh, agenda uh, internationally. Um, and I'm really pleased that you uh, are able to uh, join us today to talk about uh, your continuing work in this area, particularly around uh, the European education uh, area agenda for 2025. Uh, the many phases and functions of quality assurance in higher education in uh, Europe. And I give the floor to you, uh, Sutira. Um, can you also let us know for how long you will be talking uh, approximately and uh, whether there's an opportunity for questions at the end? Of course, of course, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm here for the questions and the comments. <laughs> uh, I'll be talking for about half an hour. And if I go over that, then please stop me. Uh, but it will be around, yeah, around this time. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen then. Yeah, um, and anyone, if you have questions also, just put them in the chat or comments or any kind of reflection throughout uh, Sotira's presentation, just put them in the chat and we can pick up on those uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay. Um, can you can you see it? Okay. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Melanie. Uh, we we did meet yeah these years ago. I think it was actually the governing by inspection project because I've done quite a few of governing by numbers inspection you know projects. So, um, but this um, presentation today, what I'm going to be talking about is based on work that I've been doing the last. Um, five years uh, on a project called METRO. Um, METRO is funded by the European Research Council uh, and it is examining um, international organizations, the role on the production of quantification in transnational governance um, and also the effects that this work has on them and their interdependencies um, and, and, and the work that they do. So um, Metro really focused on four different case studies. Um, we looked at the construction of the Sustainable Development Goal 4. Uh, we looked at poverty um, and the construction measurement of, of global poverty. We also looked at statistical capacity development. And what I'm going to be talking about today is really this the fourth case, um, which was the rise of the European um, Education Area 2025. Initially, um, the case study in the original proposal um, of, of the project would work on not at the EEA 2025, because it was written before that kind of came into existence. Um, it would be looking at the collaboration of the uh, European Commission with the OECD, uh, which has been a, a long-standing interest of mine. Um, but as it happened, uh, as we were starting the project in 2017, there was this big announcement for the um, construction of this common European education area. Of course, I couldn't but jump onto the case because, um, you know, the Europeanization of ed education has been um, an interest of mine really since 2006 when I I got my first um, job as a, as a research fellow working on a project actually that was looking at uh, uh, fabricating um, quality. That was the name, the, the title of the project in European education. And, and it was quite extraordinary to actually see the announcement of such an area, um, given that for a long, long time in all my interviews at the Commission, and elsewhere, of course, in kind of um, member states and with education ministers, ministers across Europe, um, everybody was absolutely adamant to say that um, education policy uh, is nationally governed. Um, there is, um, you know, the rule of subsidiarity, uh, international organizations um, and especially the EU um, have absolutely nothing to do with how education is governed in member states. Um, the Commission from its own uh, place, you know, they would talk about um, never really harmonization, but actually about convergence and about the fact that they are there absolutely respecting 
um, you know, uh, national policies on education, but there to help and kind of offer a kind of this role of, of the expert and trying to kind of disseminate best practice, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So from these very, very strong positions um, of um, you know, describing um, the governing of European education as a very kind of um, soft um, and kind of remote um, agenda um, that the Commission has to actually talk and announce the construction of a European education area by 2025 was a really big moment. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, we decided in the project that we, we better follow it, knowing, of course, that uh, absolutely the OECD would have a role in this, given that the OECD has for m a long, long time been the main producer of data through PISA uh, for the governing of European education. So um, we kind of started in 2017, then, uh, you know, a lot of things happened, the other cases, you know, so it's been kind of um, the case that has been, you know, slow in the making, <laughs> you know, in every project, there's always a part of it that kind of is left behind. The SDG4 was extremely interesting, COVID happened, the other cases were running. So this case has been been building slowly really since um, 2017 um, and um, it's only really now uh, the last few months that I have been uh, a lot more active in, in um, you know, uh, collecting policy documents, analysing, taking interviews from different actors um, in, um, in the European education policy space and especially higher education which is where we decided we would um, we would focus upon, and I'll explain in a moment why. So uh, this is why I'm saying this is a working paper, and this is why I said at the start um, I'll be really, really um, you know uh, appreciative of of comments and critical comments uh, on on what we're uh, doing, as this is kind of really work in progress. Um, okay, so. Perfect. So I, I'll, I'll start really by kind of giving an overview um, of, of the paper and the key issues that are emerging. And I think one of the first ones is, is one that I've, I think I've almost touched upon with my introduction. This kind of simultaneous push and pull that is happening in European education, um, on the one hand, trying to find ways of standardizing it with, um, you, you might be aware of the Lisbon process for you know, and then beyond the Lisbon process, there's there's been very kind of consistent efforts to actually find you know ways of measuring education performance in in Europe um, versus kind of opening it out, kind of leaving if you like the technocratic be behind to open it out to wider discussions about the need uh, for education for culture as a way of creating a common European demos, you know, a common European people and obviously you know the current events you know they'll be enhancing this kind of efforts um, even further then really another aspect that we see um for a long time has been the construction of different focal areas so we started you know with the european higher education area in 2000 then the european research area was instigated in 2010 and then they brought out you know this idea of the european education area in 2017 so all these different areas are really interesting in the ways that they interact or don't interact and that's you know um, something you know to to always be looking at, um, but also, you know, how come, you know, the European Commission always comes up with these different ideas uh, and, and different ways of, of kind of governing the education policy space. As I said, from the very beginning of, of my work uh, in um, on the Europeanization of education, but really since 2000, quality assurance has been the major way of kind of governing the European education space it's kind of from kind of a soft governance point of view setting up measurement systems through indicators through benchmarks to actually influence European um, education in different member states given the rule of subsidiarity which of course despite the construction of the European education area still holds you know there's nothing that has actually changed of course in terms of the the legal kind of uh, structure um, of how education is governed and last and this is kind of my you know bold if you like statement of the day and what we're trying to test with the work that we're doing now the potential really for higher education quality assurance 
to be acting as a blueprint for constructing the European education area. So if there is a way, I guess I'm saying, and this is kind of a, you know, where I'm trying to push the argument a little bit further, if there is a way of actually standardizing um, European diplomas, European quality assurance systems to create mobility um, across Europe within higher education, can this work that has been developing over the last you know, over 20 years, um, can this be used as a blueprint to actually enhance mobility in European schooling and education, you know, more broadly, you know, larger than higher education? Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of calling it back to the future because what happened, you know, when first, you know, the, the area kind of was declared, you know, was announced as a strategy um, by actually President Macron in, uh, in 2017, it had a lot of the elements of, um, you know, European education discourses as they had emerged really in the 1970s when we had the first kind of efforts to construct a European strategy on education. Um, of course, populism, nationalism, you know, uh, Trumpism, Brexit were key uh, forces behind, you know, the, the the production of it. And and in interviews that I've already taken, a lot of people say that a lot of actors in the field were actually taken aback. They didn't expect such a declaration. So it was almost like a it felt very much like a reaction to the events um, of the time. But what it really it kind of declared was kind of this focus on a shared identity and a common destiny. You know, what they keep on calling really since 2017 in all these documents as a European way of life. Um, and these, <laughs> these terms are, are strange terms because they, you know, they are very vague. They talk about the creation of a European culture, but without really specifying what a European way of life is. And of course, the ways that these things always are constructed are as uh, you know us versus others so the european way of life against is different from american or other kind of global uh, politics it's 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 really us so it has really very strong echoes from the 1980s when one kind of europe was built on creating this kind of common um demos you know common people by mobilizing education, mobilizing kind of networking and lots of investment in education. Think of the Erasmus program, which was instigated in the 80s. Um, and also, of course, using kind of this idea of a common culture quite a lot. But there is also a very significant difference. And this is where, you know, I just want to kind of uh, focus on for a moment, you know, what we certainly didn't have in the 70s and 80s is all the work that has been done the last kind of 10, 15 years on constructing um, ways of measure, um, measuring um, indicators, benchmarks and, you know, quality assurance systems to actually kind of govern the European education space. So, so we kind of we we see kind of almost like a, a a bit of going back, but also going forward in that this is actually a different space from how we used to know it, and and these processes obviously have a um, a, a great influence in these things. Um, and you know, how we, higher education of course has seen enhanced versions of this, you know, with the Bologna process and and many other uh, processes that have been taking place. So really, you know, if you look at the documents of 2017, um, what they declare is kind of a vision for 2025 will be a Europe in which learning, studying and doing research would not be hampered by borders. A continent where spending time in another member state has become the standard and where in addition to one's mother tongue, speaking two other languages has become the norm. A continent in which people have a strong sense of their identity as Europeans, of Europe's cultural heritage and its diversity and really it's this kind of this key idea of mobility um, in Europe um, that is kind of um, pushing for constructing these systems of quality assurance so that mobility is actually uh, ca can actually happen and it's a core obviously notion of constructing a common space where people can can travel and study and work so we don't really see anything new here you know all these discourses have been there for a long long time what's being declared here but we actually as i said before 
as a reaction to developments of the time, Brexit, Trump, etc., we see kind of almost a reinvigoration of bringing these things actually up uh, again, you know, given 10, 15 years of a very strong focus on a more technocratic, if you like, way of governing European education using indicators and benchmarks. Okay, so just a year later, and as I kind of, as I said, slowly <laughs> been kind of uh, collecting um, documents and doing work on the case, in May 2018, um, they announced the, these four flagship initiatives that are really uh, will kind of carry the agenda, will are the main pillars, if you like, of the construction of the European education uh, space by 2025. This is the mutual recognition of diplomas and learning periods abroad, the improvement of language learning, the European Student Card Initiative and the European European universities um, initiatives and initiative and the last, you know, bo both the, stu the student card and the universities initiative, they're there, you know, to actually enhance this kind of aspect of mobility. So it was really then that we started thinking, you know, there is something happening here, you know, they talk about European education area, but, you know, three out of the four kind of key pillars of, of the agenda are actually initiatives that relate to higher education. And it was then really that we decided that, you know, maybe looking at higher education quality assurance processes would be um, a way of actually understanding what is actually um, happening here. Interestingly, in 2020, as you know, the agenda develops, um, there is a broadening uh, of it. You know, we talk about there is a talk about the quality, education and training, inclusion, green and digital transitions, teachers, higher education, and the geopolitical um, dimension. As you see, again, higher education has an important role here, and it has a important role not only in it being in itself there as a key area, but also in being one of the main areas where you know, work on quality has um, probably been the more most advanced in European education. Um, it is all about inclusion and gender equality and universities are seen both as the key drivers of green and digital transitions, but also, of course, um, in their geopolitical dimension, universities, and as I will show you in a moment, are seen as, as key actors in kind of pushing this idea of um, a global Europe, you know, Europe as a global actor. So, you know, we continue to see that relevance and emphasis on higher education as a key space, as a, if you like, the anchoring of a uh, European education space as a whole. Interestingly enough, um, and only actually, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, we see that now uh, the European education area does not have a specific date to be accomplished by. So what I've been talking about all this time, so the EEA 2025, we see that the 2025 is dropped and now the term is actually used to describe everything that the Commission is um, doing. Um, so if you go into the European Commission's website on, you know, in education, that's what you'll see. You know, it is everything is called everything comes under the European education area. And of course, it, it makes sense because, as I said, a lot of these declarations are kind of put out there as, a, as statements, as a, a, as a way of creating a narrative and a, a discourse with repercussions, of course, because a lot of funding comes with them um, and a lot of, you know, new initiatives. Um, but then, you know, they actually really need something to, to carry them, you know, something to actually um, work towards. And I think what the solution that the Commission found here, it's obvious, is that they would just call everything European education area, everything that they were doing. Focusing, of course, on the areas that I mentioned before, but actually bringing everything under this um, agenda, which is very interesting in itself in terms of, you know, uh, how these initiatives kind of evolve over time. And um, in a communique from the Commission, um, as I said, just a couple of months ago, this um, emphasis now on European universities comes really strongly. And it, it is of interest to me uh, here, the fact that they don't really talk about higher education so much as they talk about European universities. And I think that's an interesting kind of shift in discourse um, in, in the fact that they actually, as you'll see, 
put a lot of agency on universities as doing actually quite a lot of this governing work that is required to construct the European education area. So um, they'll strengthen the European dimension in higher education and research so that it becomes the visible expression of a distinctly European approach. Um, and that's an interesting statement in that it is as specific as it is completely vague. You know, what does it mean? What is a specific European approach in doing research? Um, it's a question to be asked. Support universities, they're saying, as lighthouses of a, our, our European way of life through a trifled focus on quality and, and relevant for future proof skills, diversity, etc. So this, you, what I was saying about the agency, you know, universities as lighthouses of our European way of life, empower universities as actors of change uh, in the twin green and digital transitions, and reinforce universities as drivers of the EU's global role and leadership. So that is that is quite a, a heavy task that the universities here are given. And again, I, um, I think that the focus on universities, especially through these European universities initiatives, when where different European universities can come together and construct almost kind of uh, campuses that are unified and people can move around them. There is a lot a lot of, you know, investment and work in promoting European universities as having quite a few different roles in the construction of European education area and actually of Europe, let's be honest, you know, when they talk about, um, you know, the lighthouse of a European way of life, this is this is quite um, interesting. Of course, uh, and that has to be um, remembered. Um, as I said before, none of this kind of just appears out of the blue. There has been quite a lot of work uh, that has been done in quality assurance um, in uh, in European higher education that actually has is placing universities at this point in time where they can actually deliver some of these promises. OK, and that is part of that document, uh, the communique that I was speaking about, where they talk about the European quality assurance and recognition system, where the quality of qualification is assured, the qualifications are digitized, recognized automatically across Europe, um, doing away with the bureaucracy that hinders mobility, etc. So in that same document, two things happen at the same time. A, the cultural, you know, the discourse, the narrative of European universities as agents of teens, um, but also the how, you know, and that this quality assurance and recognition system uh, is absolutely key in doing away with the bureaucracy, in promoting mobility. So I think for the first time ever, at least in my experience of, of working in this area, we see that these discourses and practices of quality assurance are put to work for the fabrication of this ideal common Europe. There is this kind of mix, if you like, of, of the aspirational, the discursive, the narrative with um, the very technical and technocratic that kind of these quality assurance procedures bring. So I guess um, the main argument that I want to put forward here is that um, apart from looking at a, a, a huge amount of emphasis that now is being given on higher education in, in taking this role of constructing the European education area, um, we saw also um, we see also a, a huge expansion of the field of quality assurance in higher education beyond Bologna, I would say. So the Bologna process has been absolutely key in developments really since 2000 and continues to be key. Um, but we also see multiple other actors uh, and discourses emerging towards the, the building of quality assurance of higher education in, in Europe. So, um, yeah, following really um, this establishment of the common European um, research area, the European higher education area and now the European education area in 2017, um, you know, as I said, on the one hand, these declarations have are look as primarily discursive, but they have practical implications in that they have um, they come with quite a, a massive amount you know, of investment in them. And they also point towards specific policy directions. 
So um, in terms of looking at the field and exploring what is out there just now and the different key actors, apart from Bologna, there are several other areas that um, are we are um, investigating in the project. And a key actor absolutely is ENQA, the European Network for Quality Assurance, which was established quite early on, but it's really the last um, few years that has taken a very active role in, in kind of um, producing reports that actually, you know, um, import, if you like, bring different European universities, you know, they give them the registration of being, you know, members of um, um, of, of go going through quality assurance procedures. Um, and this has led to the establishment of ECOR and more recently DECOR. You know, the role of the Commission is absolutely key here um, because of the funding prioritization that it gives to these initiatives as, as they were declared, as I've already mentioned. Absolutely, the Bologna process, the Bologna um, process follow-up group is is continues to be key, and they keep on they they meet every two years, and the Commission and and of course are members um, of the Bologna um, uh, follow-up group, and and they try to to influence these um, developments. Um, we have also a very important document, the European Standards and Guidelines, that was. Um, produced by uh, ENQA in 2015. And this is really, if you like, the Bible of quality assurance in higher education in Europe. And it's an interesting document in that it both kind of um, puts, kind of specifies specific standards that universities have to follow, but also has this other side of it, which is the guidelines, which is kind of a, a looser way of interpreting these standards, because of course, um, you know, uh, different contexts, you know, they can't really follow there, there can't, there cannot be specific standards that everyone can follow. So the guidelines kind of give ways, give um, advice on how to actually follow the, the standards that are uh, pushed. The OECD's role is is absolutely crucial in that it continues to do a lot of work uh, for higher education in Europe through different projects that they are contracted to um, to do. And uh, last but not least, the role of the E4. This is um, a, a group that um, of an association that has, you know, its membership is ENQA, um, the European University Association, the European Students' Union and Eurasia as well. So again, this is another kind of, um, you know, the interdependence and the workings, you know, of how these different actors interconnect is, is an important aspect of, um, of, of how things are, are unfolding. In conclusion, and I know I've, I've just gone over my time, quality assurance, we see it as an instrument of, of governing, but also changing universities, um, but also an intricate and, if you like, continuously unfolding kind of web of relations and actors that kind of strengthen the system further. So though if we started, you know, with the Bologna process as the key kind of uh, way, the key space where quality assurance in higher education was being constructed and mobilized and strengthened, what I tried to um, describe here, uh, and, and I know it was quite quick, but it was quite a, a diverse field of different actors that now work together with the support of the Commission because of the European education area, the declaration and the different pillars and the different initiatives. So higher education and its quality assurance is really, really key in this area. And um, if you like, as, as the final conclusion, the, the QA in higher education has led to what I described this earlier as this very interesting discursive and practical mix of the technocratic and and the political so um, the european education area with the central role that higher education and universities have with it can actually like fulfill a double function both kind of pushing and pushing all the time further ahead you know quality assurance and some form of standardization and convergence of european education systems but also, and very interestingly and creatively, if you like, from a kind of a narrative analysis point of view, pushing this idea that European universities are the creators, the carriers of a, of a European way of life. And I'll just stop here and looking forward to your comments and uh, questions. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Satira. It's it's quite interesting to hear your talk as I've been working with uh, the EU and European funded projects for quite a long time. Um, and um, kind of your talk also made me think that um, is, could some of the reason why uh, all of this is particularly directed at higher education and universities because, because of the fact that countries don't want, really want the EU to be involved in compulsory education? I mean, given that the EU doesn't really have any hard power to uh, regulate the education space, um, I guess they would have have most opportunities to get countries on board if it were to do with higher education instead of children in a compulsory school age. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I mean, I think it's it's a much more it's an easier space for the Commission to to work on. But I, as I did say at the very start, and that was kind of my bold, if you like, the bolder statement of the day. I did have interviewees that work in higher education um, in, in, in Europe, um, you know, suggesting that it could be used, kind of finding a way of actually making the system work and really promote mobility. It could be a way of actually doing more with compulsory schooling as well. So I, I don't know if they said it because from their point of view, that's, one, that's what they want to push and if that would be accepted i'm pretty sure uh, you know a lot of people would disagree with this even at the commission um but it's interesting that you know i don't know I, I, having worked in this area for the like what 15 and plus years i i'm i'm, I'm open like I, th I think it's full of surprises and things that were completely unthinkable 10 years ago actually now happen so who knows um yeah but i, I mean i totally agree with you i mean obviously this is a more productive area, especially given all the work that has been done already. Um, yeah, thanks. Chris, I see you have a question. Yes, well, thank you. It was not really a question, but uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And it also reminds me a little bit of all the European discussions on how uh, to classify skills and education levels in a way. As you have so many discussions, nobody really knows how to do it. And each time there are like different debates, different pros and cons. Uh, so, uh, and the reflection actually on the European quality assurance and convergence of European education systems uh, made me think a little bit about the European University Institute. So I don't know, in Florence, uh, uh, Firenze, I should say. <laughs> so I thought, well, could this institute uh, or more institutes like these uh, who are spread it across Europe, uh, can such a concept have a more important role to play? So I was thinking a little bit about uh, uh, the remark that you made at the end, like, well, you know, you have this difference between what Europe wants and what the country wants. Uh, but if you have these European University Institutes in countries, say you have these students and they can vote by their feet, right? So they can go there actually, and they can have these international interactions. And then these European preferences might uh, open up. And then you, if you see it, then you can actually act upon it. So I'm very curious uh, well, what you think about that, like more European University Institutes or or less or? Yeah, um, thanks. I. I, I... Couldn't really answer the question. That's the truth because my my perspective, the way that I, I try to study this, is from a kind of a critical perspective. Try to understand how uh, it happens and and why it happens. I'm not, you know, making policy. Um, what I know for sure is that the Commission has invested quite a lot on the European University Institute as a way of actually promoting that idea. You know, that here is a is is a university that actually promotes, you know, that. Um, European governance and, and do does work on transnational governance and it is a fantastic university you know and and, and has actually brought together a, a stellar set of of um, of, of academics um, so so trying to create this kind of um, really elite institutions if you like that promote um, European governance European culture um, European uh, way of doing research um, uh, yeah I'm not sure if um, it's 
the the initiative if it multiplied in different nations you know if it would actually still carry that elite function that it has so th there is a question there but um i don't really have an answer to to this question it is interesting what i found interesting interesting is that you know it the commission did notice you know and and wanted to you know support the work that that specific university was doing uh, probably i don't know maybe more than others um but uh, the truth is that I, I don't I don't have an answer to this. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't expect really an answer. Yeah. But, but I was thinking, thinking about harmonizing things and going to one, towards one system. Then, you, then it's kind of important that, that people can. So now, as you mentioned, it's kind of elite, right? Everybody wants to work there, but it's almost impossible. And I also saw actually, Melanie, that they have a very nice governance department. So I thought yeah. it's actually very much simple yeah. for you. But I mean, yeah. I thought, well, if, if you make it a little bit like more normal, I mean, so standardized things can only happen when they when they are apparent in each country. And so, and it's now so elite and special that I think that harmonization is difficult still to achieve, perhaps. But I, I also don't know, I'm not an expert. So it was really like yeah. a, a wild. I thing guess it, it also is an example of, um, um, I mean, how the EU uh, wants to govern the education agenda and the kind of tools they choose for it. Um, uh, and it seems a bit contradictory to me to have like uh, very elite universities uh, as a as a way to um, establish a European agenda and then also have a kind of a harmonization agenda. Um, it seems that there is not really a clear strategy almost on how to um, ensure an education arena, but maybe that's another example of, of how the EU is not really strategic in some of the areas, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my reflection. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I see you have your hand up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your lecture, uh, Sotira. Um, uh, what, what do you think are, are consequences for us from this agenda, from this uh, quality assurance uh, thing that the uh, European Union is building? And that, that's, that's one question. And the other question is um, that connected to what Melanie said. Uh, for me, it feels a bit um, uh, uncomfortable that the, the scientific, the technocratic and political agenda are mixed up in this uh, trajectory that you described. And um, how, do, how do you think about that? Isn't, isn't it a bit dangerous to be a part of the political discourse? Um, it, it, is, it is very... I don't know if I would call it dangerous, but uh, from a sociological point of view, from a policy analysis point of view, is very interesting. And I think there is a general tendency and from the findings of Metro um, across the other cases as well, uh, what we see is a very strong tendency to, if you like, move from this idea of um, kind of the technicization of policy, you know, the depoliticization of policy through constructing these measurements, you know, quality assurance systems, whatever they're called, um, into a move towards their repoliticization. So if I just give you uh, very, very briefly, you know, my analysis, you know, of the SDG4 and, and the developments there, what comes really strongly from kind of the, the governing discourse of the sustainable development goals and SDG4 specifically um, is that, um, you know, data is absolutely crucial. There is nothing that can be done uh, without without data. Um, but there's this idea of, for example, but good, good enough data is okay. You know, uh, we need to kind of focus on on what uh, we need to to achieve, um, and the technical is important, but the political is key as well. And kind of make like persuading countries to be part of the process, to to um, to democratize, if you like, the way decisions are made over numbers and over what to measure, etc. Is, is part of uh, of the discourse and is a way of actually persuading people to adopt these measurement agendas. But but the way this happens is through this repoliticization, right? That, that's how I, I see it. That's how I, I call it. Uh, and that's interesting. So uh, 
maybe where we are now is that we, you know, for a long time, if you like go back to European education, we had this kind of push and pull of, you know, lots of talk on, you know, creating a common demos, almost a, you know, if you, if you look at um, policy documents of the 80s, they're almost kind of, they resemble kind of the making of a, it's really almost propaganda, <laughs> you know, they, they're resembling kind of nation states kind of documentation, you know, the, the European flag, the European anthem, the European, you know, the European way of life, like, you know, I, I don't understand what a European way of life is, you know. No, how, so, so, yeah, so, so it's very much like a nation making uh, discourse, right? But then all this kind of disappears and they say, no, 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 we need to focus on what we can do and we can only do what we can measure. And then it's all about Lisbon process onwards, all about indicators and benchmarks. And now suddenly they realize, oh, actually that wasn't enough. And here we have Brexit and here we had Trump and we lost the people and we need to reconstruct the people and then bring them together. And I think that is why this is such an interesting moment. Um, the fact that they go hand in hand. It's dangerous. Is it dangerous? I don't know. It's dangerous if we don't study it. If we do study it and discuss it and expose it, then it's not dangerous anymore. Well, I guess, sorry, it, Cora, it, 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 feel, it feels a bit dangerous for me, so but I'm a political <laughs> scientist, so I'm, I'm, I'm always mistrusting uh, government. So <laughs> yeah, I guess whether it's dangerous or not is also depending on the actual democratic process that underlies all of this. Um, uh, I mean, how is this agenda being set? Um, um, yeah, and what what actual influence uh, does the EU have over nations to implement this agenda? Um, or is it just power by influence or soft governance or how are they trying to make this happen? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, yeah, I mean, we do live in liberal democracies and, you know, that's why I'm saying, you know, these things can be controlled and these people are accountable. Um, but that's where I think what I mentioned about the fact that we also see a shift in discourse you know, in putting a lot of emphasis on universities. And this is where I think, you know, this soft governance of universities and universities having an agency in this. And as we know really well, universities are hugely competitive, you know, uh, and they want to do well in rankings and they want to have the funding from the commission. So uh, I think it places some emphasis, it kind of, if you like, pushes the responsibility own universities themselves um, and that yeah that should be interesting to examine and, and study as we move on you know have our universities like EUI like may, maybe others do they take a, a stand in kind of pushing for these things more you know this uni European universities initiative where different European universities come together to construct almost kind of digital campuses where students can move around these three or four universities. Yeah. Um, are there some spaces where these are things are taken up more? And I'm, I'm not sure I haven't studied, studied this yet, but it will be interesting to examine. Yeah. What is the role of universities themselves here? Yeah. And maybe uh, another question in that respect, given that some of the people you interviewed were thinking that um, kind of approach with universities and trying to get them into this kind of European agenda, thinking that that will kind of, um, also be relevant to change compulsory education or bring a kind of compulsory education into a European agenda. What are their ideas on how that would look then for compulsory education? I mean, you could it's far more difficult to have people um, kind of move between countries for education um, because they're not adults yet. Um, I mean, it's also, a, I guess, more difficult to do that with teachers. Uh, you would, maybe you could establish kind of a European primary school. I don't know, but that sounds quite complex to me as well. Uh, so what, what are they thinking on how that would work for compulsory education? 
I, I don't think I don't think they're thinking um, along these lines yet um, at all. Um, it, it, I think we should always, you know, despite the discussion that we have and, and all the different initiatives, I think subsidiarity is still a very uh, important important rule that uh, that hasn't changed, and I can't see it being changed. However, the the strength of feeling, if you like, uh, about subsidiarity has definitely, I can definitely see it changed, even, you know, uh, you know, at the commission or it, there was a time when the rule of subsidiarity was considered so important that there was absolutely no discussion of constructing any convergence or, you know, the, the commission would just do work as, as an expert and try to help different countries. But that was about that. And that we have seen that it has changed a lot in, in this uh, proclamation of, of uh, the making of a European education area. Um, so now, you know, uh, definitely education is a very important aspect of um, of European governance. And it wasn't like I, I, can't, I remember like yesterday, you know, when I first started and we were going to European studies conferences and we we're talking about um, education and they were saying, what are you doing here? You know, that education is not governed by the commission. You know, there is nothing. But this has certainly changed. Um, and that's why I'm saying, you know, let's see how these um, initiatives evolve over the next few years. Let's see politically also what happens, because, I mean, if you think about what is now happening in Ukraine has brought so much unity and strength into the European project, like nothing, you know, over the last, I don't know, like since Second World War. So what are these developments going to bring? Who knows? You know, it's just it's really relieving to absolutely extraordinary times and uh, and and education is is um yeah is always affected of course um by all these political developments yeah absolutely great i can see that people are dropping off uh they also probably want to have some lunch before next meeting of course, of course. so if there aren't any other questions i think there aren't Thank you so much. This is actually is being developed slowly as a, as a paper. We hope to have a draft of it in the summer. So if anyone is more interested in seeing what actually, you know, finding out more or actually kind of reading th th through things a bit more carefully and, and slowly, I'm more than happy to share it. So just drop me a line and I can, yeah. I can share it. Great. Yep. And great you for sharing your kind of preliminary findings with us and having an opportunity to discuss that. I really kind of started thinking about uh, the European uh, area quite differently uh, uh, now. So um, it has really sparked my uh, my thinking as well. So uh, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you everyone for joining um, and um, hope to see you uh, at the LEARN conference as well on the 24th uh, of this month, uh, where we have another interesting afternoon of, of session. So I hope to see you there as well, uh, Sotira, if, if not uh, before. So thank you again um, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.